Today, I am talking with Jedediah Collins. Jedediah Collins is a former NFL player. He is also a certified financial planner, author of the book, Your Money Vehicle, and adjunct professor of personal finance. He's also the founder of the Money Vehicle Financial Literacy Program. Welcome, Jedediah. John, this is truly an honor and a privilege. Uh, I have enjoyed watching your message continue to grow and impact. So thank you for allowing me to introduce myself and uh, Money Vehicle's message to your community. Well, likewise. So you've been called by a number of people, the hardest working man in personal finance. So fill us in on the details of your bio so we have a better sense of you know who Jedediah Collins is and kind of how you went from NFL to CFP. You know, I, I love that claim. And truly throughout the pandemic, I did have several people kind of call me that because as the world closed down, I continued to both dive into our money vehicle program as well as set up six to 10 virtual meetings each and every day. Um, regardless of what you know was taken away, I was always a 5 a.m. kind of guy. And as you look at the NFL, that was really one of my claims to fame, um, being a, what I self-proclaimed, the wake the weights up guy. I was the first one in the building. I would go and legitimately scream at uh, the squat racks or the, the bench press, whatever we were about to go do. And it was just the mentality and the character that I wanted the coaches to see of my work ethic. That is something and habits are something, John, we're going to dive into somewhat. Um, that is an aspect of myself that I see every area I've been able to achieve success and know it is because of that mentality and that mindset. So hardest working man in financial literacy is one I wear as a badge of honor. Um, but as I made that kind of career shift from the NFL to certified financial planner, it was made out of fear. It was made out of uh, an embarrassing moment of some degree. And it was truly made because I saw the things the game of football was going to take from me. And I woke up to the reality that the NFL dream is only being experienced by a very fortunate few who understand the language of money. And that realization came to me uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, as I got one of my first bigger paychecks from the NFL and spent every dime of it before I even cashed the check. Uh, common tale, common story. My full disclosure is I put my money into an engagement ring, which may have been a great investment, was not a good financial habit. Making and spending money immediately is, is not going to get you where you want to go. So that alerted me and woke me up. It, it kind of took me to a place where I said, what was I supposed to do with these paychecks? What, what are the educated people in money doing with big dollars early in their lives? Spending on things is definitely not one of them. And so my wife, 14 years later, we're still married. So yes, cute. But it really alerted me to the idea that even though I was an accounting major and a business degree, nobody had spoken or taught me the language of money. And so I went to Borders bookstores back when uh, people went to bookstores, walked the aisles of those personal finance, got the gurus, Susie Orman, Kiyosaki, Dave Ramsey, uh, Jim Cramer, and just started dig digesting all of that information until a mentor of mine challenged me and said, hey, if you really want to start to understand how this thing works, start looking into the certification for financial planning. And so I took that challenge on each off season after my third year to start studying for and passing the CFP while playing in the NFL. Um, and people compliment me and applaud that idea. Really, we got a lot of time in the off season. I mean, Sunday, Super Bowl, everybody's going to have a, a good amount of downtime. I just used it wisely. And so looking at where I was going in football, being cut early, on, early and often in my career, I realized this was not going to be the – Jed's going to make $100 million and never have to work again career. I started to see the road of finance. I started to get passionate about it. And once I felt confident in myself and the place I was heading in my journey, I really found a purpose in helping others communicate and translate this language of money. So what is it? So how did that you, you went from reading the books of the experts, right, to creating your money vehicle? And what is it that kind of separates your money vehicle uh, as something that 
that really speaks to, because I know you talk to a lot of NFL teams. You do a lot of work, obviously, in the classroom, uh, in colleges, as an adjunct professor, uh, and I believe also in high schools. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you've brought uh, that that your unique perspective um, to this Your Money vehicle? The combination of getting money at an early age through the NFL, as well as becoming a certified financial planner, having that real life experience paired with the subject matter expertise, I got to approach it and ask the question, if I were to have gotten that paycheck again at 16, 18, 20 or 22, what are the 10 steps? What are the 10 things I wish I would have known and gone and done? And so what Money Vehicle really does at its core is build analogies, build stories, make the confusing concepts like compound interest or taxes, the progressive income tax code, Roth IRAs. How do we tell all of those things through a storied element? How do we show visuals and get people to comprehend what is happening and then going and being confident in going and doing it on their own? So what Money Vehicle truly is, and you mentioned, you know, the variety of places we empower students, we're really hyper-focused. And what I asked was, why didn't I get this class in high school? And not every student's going to go to college. Definitely not everybody's going to become an NFL player. But every student in high school is going to get a paycheck. Why is this a subject that we have overlooked? And that's been a, you know, 13-year journey for me of asking that question. So what Money Vehicle was truly founded at is where is that high school financial literacy curriculum? We set out to build it directed age appropriate for high school students to be able to meet the state and national standards for, for high schools, but to truly look at the teacher and empowering them on how to deliver this message in their classroom, using those stories, using those analogies. And so where we're becoming unique is a semester long curriculum is not something that is often shared in the high school environment. There are very few of them out there. And as states start to mandate the requirement for this class, there's just not a whole lot to choose from. So we're bringing not just the edutainment directed at the student, how do we engage and entertain them, but also as we look at these teachers being forced or having the opportunity to teach a new subject, how do we provide them with all of the resources they're gonna need in their classroom to really deliver this at a different level. So Money Vehicle is attacking a, a small niche, if you will, but we truly want to be the best high school financial literacy curriculum in the country. Well, I can attest to your ability to command a room because uh, we were both speaking at a conference and I watched your talk about your Money Vehicle um, to this conference and you had the audience wrapped around your finger. So I can't think of anybody who would be better to try to communicate these kind of key concepts. And I was going to ask you, we are going to delve into the fact that you have you know, two younger girls. And I want to talk about that because this is the Art of Allowance podcast. But I actually want to jump ahead because I think it's uh, a good time to ask you this question. So compounding, really difficult concept to get across to kids because we are, as a species, just not future, future focused. So but it's still really one of the most important concepts for us to grasp. But, you know, it's like I, even when I talk to my kids who you know, we talked about this stuff a lot, it's, you know, they get <laughs> they're they're just it's just not something that they want to think about way off into their futures. Right. So do you have any thoughts about how we can best get this power of compounding, which is really the power of time? How can we get this essential idea across to our younger kids, if we can at all. So uh, the, the message you landed on, time. Time is a very, very difficult thing for young people to comprehend, to utilize, and to use as their most important tool. Any investor in the world wants one thing, they want more time. And so what we do is, again, try to communicate that. If I'm working with an NFL player, their version of time is flipped on a, a complete uh, a top and said, in the next three to four years, you're going to make 80% of the income you'll make in your lifetime. That is a, a huge challenge for anyone because you have to see 20, 30 years of time in the future and begin to prepare for that. The uh, real visual that I love to share with students, and this is something each of your parents can do, begin with a, a pack of Starburst. You might need two packs, um, but I like Starburst because it comes pre-wrapped and you're able to move it around. 
And to show how compounding is going to work over that time period, you explain a little story. And I call them Spendra, Salvador, and Investina. You'll understand the, the names here in a moment. But as you explain, you say all three of them want to go and achieve some goals financially. They went and got a job at the local movie theater. Each of them are going to get paid one starburst a week. As they go, they work, they get earn that, earn that income, get one starburst, and you can set it out in front of them, the three different characters, three different payments. What you then explain to them is any starburst that is left in the bank, the bank of, for me, dad, or the bank of your parents, will then get a matching starburst. They will get paid a created starburst for leaving that one starburst in the bank. And so as you play through the first one, you make your three payments and you, and you ask a question. Well, what's the best CD or what's the best music out right now? Lizzo, Beyonce, two of the, the goats right at the moment. Okay, let's go with Beyonce. Excellent. Well, Spendra decided to take her one starburst and went and got the new uh, Beyonce uh, music on iTunes. Great. She went and got a, a, some music. Salvador and Investina said, no, we're going to wait. We want to get paid a little bit of interest. So the next week goes by. They get their weekly payment, one starburst each, one, two, three. But now Salvador and Investina gets that second starburst as created income paid on interest on that first one. You play through the round again. You say, well, you know, what's the best movie out? Okay, whatever movie's out at the moment. Spendra went and saw that movie today. Take her starburst away. She now, again, has zero. But now she has music. She got to go see a movie. And you look at Salvador and Investina. And Salvador says, well, I kind of wanted to do dinner and a movie, so I'm not ready to spend yet. And Investina says, nope, that is nothing what I want to go and do. And so as you play through one more round, everybody gets that Starburst payment. You start to look at uh, Spendra. Spendra went and bought a new shirt. She's got clothes. She's got a movie. She's got music. You look at Salvador now. He not only gets that one payment of cre uh, excuse me earned income, but now you match the other Starburst, and you see the interest start to stack up. Investina the same, one payment, match with the stacking of the Starburst. But then Salvador looks and says, perfect. I now have seven Starbursts in front of me. I want to go to the movie. I want to go to dinner. I'm going to take three of my Starbursts, and I'm going to go enjoy a good, fun night. That's what I wanted in the first place, is to be able to go see this movie and have a knife out. That's phenomenal. Salvador just went from seven down to four. And you look over at Investina, she still has her seven full and says, nope, this is what I want my money to do is keep going to work for me. Last round, you pay out the three payments. Spendra, you can think of another way to go spend her money. Now Salvador is going to take his four and double it to eight. But what they really see is Investina at the end go from seven to 14 plus the one that she just went and earned. And in a matter of five minutes, you can visually identify what compounding interest does. When not just the money you go to work for, but the money that is going to work for you starts to compound and starts to create, then the, then the kids usually get to eat some of the Starburst, which is always a, a nice way to end. But it's really a, a neat visual to be able to share and show another example of that chicken or the egg. Would you rather the egg now or would you rather the chicken? Because that could produce more and more into the future. Again, that concept of time is seen in that quick Starburst analogy. I'm still waiting to pitch that to Starburst as a commercial, but uh, maybe this pocket, maybe maybe the art <laughs> allowance will uh, make that connection. <laughs> Well, uh, I, I'm not sure that will happen, mm -hmm. but I, I like that analogy. I, I'm curious, when you do that analogy in the classroom, there's got to be a few students who will say, well, but isn't Spendra at least like having some fun in the, with her life? Like, and, and Investina, especially like Salvador, at least is getting the combo, right, of the both. But Investina is getting none of that. She's just saving up all her money and, you know, living like a Spartan, not getting to see any of the see any good movies, watch any, um, any good, um, or see, or see any movies or listen to any great music. How do you respond to that? Especially because, you know, 
we talked about before, it's, you know, humans, we just are not particularly future focused. I would think in a group of teens, you're going to see a few of those uh, devil's advocates yeah. oh, yeah. step up and say, um, Love excuse me, Jed, what's up? And the question <laughs> then is, yes, well, Spendra seems like she's having such a good time. What you get to do after four rounds is start to show, hey, you know what Investina gets to go do now? She can go buy the, the Beyonce. She can go to the movie. Take off two. What she has done, though, is created money to go to work for her. Now she has the options. And they have to begin to realize if at the start you never start thinking about time in your future, you're not going to have those options yeah. later. Fast forward four weeks, the summer is over. Maybe they're going back to school. The the uh, movie theater job goes away. Spendra has nothing. Salvador might have a little, but Investina looks at it and now has the luxury of making choices and options. So it again goes back to that visualization of, could you say no now to a want to be able to have the power to find your wants and needs tomorrow or in the future? So yes, there is always that student who says, well, I want to go and I want to, I want great, but it is this comprehension and understanding of the time you go in work is earned income. If you only go to work and earn and then spend, you are a spender. Spendra is a spender. She sees things on a day-to-day -day time frame. Salvador, Salvador now starts to say, well, I wanted to go to dinner and a movie. I knew I was going to need three Starbursts to do that. I had a goal, prioritization. I had a goal in mind. Now I start to see things in a month to month, maybe even a year to year. But something that we're going to start talking about more and more is this idea of inflation and this idea of our money going to work for us. We all, and the yeah. biggest mindset shift for money vehicle students is we all must become Investina. We all have to understand that investor mindset because saving is no longer going to be enough. So that student that leads into, well, I want to do this. I want that movie. Great. Do you think you're going to want to go see another movie? Yes. Then you should start preparing for that today. You should start building your choices and your options. And the, the, yeah. the beautiful thing about investors is they see money through a decade time horizon. So if we can circle it all back to that time, Day to day, year to year, or decade to decade, they'll start to think like an investor. Yeah, it's, it is that idea of like money to the power of time, um, and uh, I think that's I think that's Morgan Housel's idea, I right? Like right, psychology of money. So I can't uh, I can't grab uh, ownership of that. But okay, so you brought up inflation, yes. and uh, let's talk there. Inflation's very real. We're recording this early twenty twenty three. Um, as painful as inflation can be, though, maybe it's also an opportunity to show our kids why investing, for example, is so important. So do you have any thoughts or tips on how to use this kind of current moment to find the silver lining that inflation might be for us to use it as a teaching tool? Uh, well, first off, I think it is a, a drastic tool being used at the moment. The one thing I say to every student that has come through is the only guarantee I can make about money is your expenses are going to go up. That is the only guarantee you can make in finances. Anybody else makes other guarantees, run away. They're probably trying to sell or steal something from you. So as we look at this, I see inflation and using that compounding analogy of Starburst that we just went through, I see this as the perfect opportunity to challenge and change the definition of financial literacy. Where we grew up, financial literacy was simple. Spend less than you make. Spend less than you make got you in a direction and got you into a plan that was going to work for you. Hopefully then you had a pension or a social security, but really this idea of inflation is giving us the moment and opportunity to double down on the idea we must not only think but act like investors. We have to begin to start to see this reality that our expenses are going to go up each and every year and every day. Saving is no longer going to be enough. If you put your money dollars into a savings account, it feels good. It's protected from risk. But without risk, you can never have the reward and the return of the investment. And so we have to begin to measure this out. 
if I know and using a, a fun financial literacy tool, the rule of 72, the rule of 72 says 72 divided by the interest rate is going to show you how long it takes money to double. Last year, inflation was 7%. 72 divided by seven is a decade. So if I look at your money and I talk to a high school student spending $1,000, an NFL player spending $10,000 a month, if I can tell you in 10 years for a fact without doing anything or buying anything more, you're going to actually spend twice that, you really start to comprehend what inflation is. But you start to even see more why we need to speak the language of money, why you need to become an investor, why you need to counter inflation by that investment process. So inflation is a, a crippling thought at the moment, but it is a awakening for not just our generation and the people who are professionals, but this young generation to say, I have no more choice. Saving is not going to be financial literacy for me. I have to become and think and like an investor. And so I have to not protect my money from risk. I have to start to produce that risk and really start to understand how I'm going to fight inflation and how my plan is going to go to a place of freedom. Yeah. And I, it's a very good point because it's not like inflation didn't exist before. The difference is now everybody, even our kids are hyper aware of inflation. You know, you go and you look at egg prices. Yeah. Uh, granted, that's a temporary spike. Yeah. That's uh, pretty crazy, but it's enough to easily have that conversation. And it, and inflation is something that is real and is happening all the time. But when it becomes as um, as 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 high as when the rate is as high as it is now, then it does open up a conversation. And I love that perspective, which is that it just it just underscores the importance of investment because we have to keep up with, if not exceed, uh, inflation. Very good point, Jed. Thank you. And I, I do. I love that. And you you mentioned eggs. I could mention airplane flights because I just had to buy some uh, over spring break to go visit my family. And it was an opportunity to talk to my girls about money and the costs of things and why we're doing this and why we need to prioritize those things. So inflation is allowing us to have that casual conversation because it is so relevant and it is so topical right now. Um uh, it is going to be interesting to see as these students and these young people grow up how they remember these moments of time. And hopefully it's not another 7% for very long. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm i glad you brought up your kids because this is something that, you know, when we're on the Art of Allowance podcast, I love having money experts on who can then talk about what they're doing with their kids. Because it's really, this is for me the crux of the show, which is that we can build on the knowledge base that we have and we can come up with these ideas. Like I know you're going to have some interesting ideas that parents can listen to um, that are going to be maybe different than ideas they've heard from other money experts or even myself uh, from my book or from other parts of this podcast or other books. So let's talk about how you're talking to your kids about money. Um, have you set up an allowance? Do you have any other systems? Basically, kind of what does the Collins family money vehicle look like? So we have not started an allowance. My girls are eight and six at the moment. Um, we do have chores, but the idea of, of paying them for them for now is not become instituted. What we've really started to communicate is the understanding of earning income, the understanding of what daddy does now downstairs in his office all day or what mommy does, how we see this idea of earned income through that concept again that continue and will forever come up, time. How do we get them to comprehend the investment of time, but really the idea of value? We don't want to just say, you go do something for five hours and you get paid for it. You put the time in, but you have to add that value. People do not pay you directly for time. They pay you for the value that you can add to their program or to whatever it is that you're helping them with. So as you associate that time and the value, we then get to translate it to the outflow side and it's the spending. So how can I connect 
what we're doing from a time and value perspective to the expense in the cost of those things. And at a young age, again, we haven't started allowance yet. I, you know, we do have ideas and, and perspectives that we're trying to in the next year or two enter into that world. But as we look at it right now, it's really the basis of money vehicle, USE, use money, understand, strategize, and be efficient. We're sticking with that understanding. If we can understand the time and the value, we then can translate it into the cost of what they want, or at least think they want at the moment. And we're starting to connect those earnings to the reality that time and value is equal to your cost. And as you go and buy that Squishmallow, which God help me, I don't need another Squishmallow. But if you can equate it to daddy working for an hour, adding value to his business, that is what is going to afford us to go and get that Squishmallow. Now we look at the family trip down to visit my my family in California. That same equation of what am I and what is our family going and adding value to that somebody is paying us for that we get to translate into that vacation, seeing that connectivity, that is the comprehension and the appreciation we're going for right now. Uh, but again, that is with an eight and six year old that the eight about to be nine is going to have to enter into a world of understanding it. And that's where I love board games, Monopoly and things like that from a dollars and cents perspective, seeing that translation and investment into those. Got it. So you're doing a lot on the kind of modeling side, you know, having them see what you, what you and your wife are doing. Um, so on the experience side, just cause I, I like to dig into this. So when they do ask you, I, I this is, you know, my, my kids are now uh, 17 and 19. So I don't know what a squishmallow is, um, but the when they ask for the squishmallow, do you have have you set anything up experientially for them uh, with regard to money, uh, where they you know they get some amount that they have to? I, I know you said you haven't tied it to chores yes. necessarily, but how does that work when they want something? So for rewards and based on behavior, goals, things that we have set again, not directly tied to like make your bed, but. We have given them set amounts of money, $20 a piece. And that has been one of the most fun things is going to Target, walking through the aisles, marking down, mark down everything you want. And the, the paper is going to fill up very quickly. And we got to mark down how much that, that piece and that item is going to cost. But the beauty was when we started to do this, you know, the second and third time was seeing them begin to work together. Now we don't have $20. Now we have $40. Now we have a whole new mm -hmm. world of things, you know, kind of open to us. But it was that realization of I can get one item for 20 or I can get two for 10. I can get five things for $2. Getting them to experience that, and that is that budget constraint concept, but getting them to experience here is the amount of money you have earned. Here are the options that you can use to spend it. That's going to be that experiential. And I, you know, it turns that trip to, to Target. Um, and we, we have also done that with gifting. Hey, you have $20 for, you know, whoever's birthday. This is how you get to choose to spend it. And it's that same process. Let's write it on paper. Let's see how much it costs. And then at the end, you get to choose how you're going to go ahead and use the dollars that are allotted to you. But um, I really have enjoyed flipping that. I'm not a big shopper. I'm not a spender as much. So uh, turning that experience that I don't enjoy into something that is more of that lesson atmosphere. Yeah, I think that's a really good point there because we all tend to look at the world and put our personal experiences or personal, um, you know, biases uh, ahead of kind of in front of everything else. So we think to our, you know, if our kid, if, if we're a saver and our kid's not, we we have a tough time kind of connecting with them. Yeah. Right. Um, I've found that because I'm more of a natural spender and I've had to really work hard to be, to get into that saver mindset. Whereas my wife is much more of a natural saver. And I don't mean that we're born that way necessarily. I just mean, that's the kind of mentality that we mm -hmm. come at for whatever reason, right? And I'm not actually sure where those 
uh, traits kind of came from. But it's easier for me and our kids have broken down a little bit like that. One's more of a spender, one's more of a saver. It's easier for me to understand the one than the other. And it's easier for her to understand the one versus the other. I think that's one of the key things as a parent is to try to trying to see the world through your different Mm -hmm. kids eyes as you're going about teaching them. You know, it's kind of the, the, uh, the idea from, uh, to, to to kill a mockingbird, the idea that you want to get inside someone's shoes and walk around a little while. It's because it's very easy to pat ourselves on the back when our kids are saving money. Right. But they aren't necessarily learning the, all the lessons they need to learn. They do need to learn how to spend money and spend Mm -hmm. money effectively. They do need to learn how to, uh, give money and give money effectively. So there's, there's a lot more to it. It's not, we can't just say, Oh yeah, my kid's saving all their money. Pat myself on the back because just imagine oh, yeah. that that kid then becomes an NFL player or whatever, whatever job they end up having where they get a massive amount of money and they have been a natural saver, but they've never been exposed to this amount of money. You just never know how, like if your brain hasn't been trained to kind of, deal with amounts of money and and understand that there are other things you can do other than just save how problematic that, problematic that can be particularly if the group you're with is all spending yeah. that huge amount of money like crazy which i imagine is one of the hardest problems for an nfl player is that you have a bunch of young guys who now have a ton of money who didn't have a ton of money before and it kind of feeds on itself, right? And I well, I want to jump on a couple things that you said. Number one, you said if your brain hasn't been trained to act in a certain way. And I think that's what we really are getting to is right now our focus with our girls is more principles and behaviors and habits, which, you know, is is paramount in their early stages of everything, but As I, you know, venture out and money vehicles growing in our message and we're interacting with more students, what I've always come to realize is I want to be out there and known and seen for speaking and educating around the language of money. How I've also accepted is that is going to fail if we don't instill the correct principles and habits. And so where I look at the NFL player or the high school student We need to begin preparing the habit of how to do it, not necessarily a budget. And I don't like that word because it is constrictive and it does have a negative connotation to many, but it's also because you set yourself up to fail at it. Where I look at habits, it's what is the initial prioritization of my goals? What are the one, two or three actions that I want to do with every paycheck that I'm going to get? So regardless of if it's $200 from driving people around at Uber or it's I just won the Super Bowl and I get $200,000, I'm going to go through the same prioritization of I know I have to designate a certain amount to my society. I know I'm going to have to designate a certain amount to my future, to my compassion, to some of the obligations in my past. And then I get to look at what is left to go and spend. And that is how you flip that culture and that mentality around. I'm not guilty about what I'm spending. This is what I have designated on my plan to go and enjoy. And it's not a what is the dollar and dimes. It is more a I've already pushed everything in the directions that I wanted to go. And so as we do look at working with children around money, Don't overlook the idea that even though you may not be talking about uh, dollars or or interest or taxes directly, you are still instilling the responsibilities and the principles that are going to find success. And I look at my world when I'm when money vehicles truly where we want it to be. It is connecting that money and the mindset notions. We talk about that a lot throughout the program. And so as we do establish our habits, that is where we're going to find our success in in money because we, without those, are not ever going to truly enjoy the process, but we're also not going to understand how to measure or continue down the road we're on. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up budgeting because it's something we wanted to discuss. And I, like you, really harp on this idea of behavior change or behavior adaptation. Um, or acquisition, because a lot of financial literacy, the concern about it is people's concern is that it's a knowledge acquisition issue. 
but there's plenty of good information out there. The issue is really the developing the habits and behaviors that you need to be money smart, right? In order to, to achieve this. And I, you know, since most people do fail at budgeting, you know, aren't we kind of setting the stage for financial literacy failure by insisting that budgeting be a bedrock principle? And let me just, I just want to clarify. It's like, I am not anti-budget. I think if you do budget, it's great, but most people don't and fail at it when they try. And the problem is if, if it's always insisted that this is a bedrock principle and most people are failing at it, how are we going to move more people into that kind of the, the camp of financial literacy? Because I think you and I both feel like this is a big opportunity is to for this neck for this generation and generations uh, coming to really look at financial literacy, to kind of look back at some of the profligate spending and say, what were you guys yeah. thinking? Right. And so the norm is financial literacy. So what are what are some of the behaviors like I would just say like core behaviors, and I would focus most on on behaviors we can try to teach our kids from a young age, so that if they don't if they don't go into budgeting, they can still become financially literate or money smart. So I think the financial industry really has to steal from the health and fitness industry, where they've been able to create those behavioral changes and how they have mentally approached them. I'm a big believer in adding the positives and not necessarily focusing on or trying to remove the negatives. You look at a budget and you say, hey, it's the beginning of the month. I hope, I hope, I hope it's the end of the month. I failed. Where we look at cash management or true behavioral change, you start with wins. I start with a habit in a principle that says, man, I got this, I did that, that's a plus, I'm already on the right track. I get to the end of the month and I'm adding up my wins, I'm not calculating my minuses. So looking at the change in, in kind of our mindsets, we can take from that, fi or that health and wellness industry. When you wanna change your diet, a lot of people go, I'm just cold turkey, not gonna eat carbs. And it's a good attempt, but you're again, every day hoping not to fail. Whereas if you flipped it, something we were talking about before we jumped on, it's, well, I want to drink two more glasses of water a day. Maybe if I start my day with a glass of water, I start by adding a positive. Now I can immediately start out with that plus and immediately get that ability to see my progression. Same way with your money. If you can start not by saying what I don't want to do with it, Start by saying what you do want to do. Designate each month, and we have our five monthly habits in the money vehicle using our money buckets. But that first of the month, in one of the age old me me my, uh, excuse me age old messages, pay yourself first. The first of the month, I put a certain amount of money to my future self. That's a habit that no matter what else happens throughout the month, I know I've achieved my priority and my goal. That is a habit and a principle that you can begin. I also look at automations. We use it on the 8th, auto 8, automate. How many of your expenses and bills and pass can you make sure are already taken care of? Are they in a separate account so you don't visualize and see it? How can you continue to add a positive by automating an expense? And then something you mentioned about giving, we call it the compassion choice. It's on the 14th of the month. 1% for, one for someone else. I'm not asking students and young people to give away hundreds of millions of dollars, but if you do give me a penny for your thoughts, identify a person, a place, or a cause outside of yourself, and that can be your friend's birthday. That is outside of yourself. That is a gift. Designate 1% each month to that idea. Those are the principles that will found you. And now when you do start to go out and say, well, I want to go and spend and have a good time, great. You have the money in your checking account that is sitting in there to enjoy, to go and have fun. The present is a gift, so use it as such. But I have already assured my success because I've started with my wins. I've started with my behaviors, and that mindset of cash management means I'm in control. Why we termed it money vehicles, we really want individuals to start sitting in the driver's seat and taking control of their financial future, the vehicle of money. And so as they sit there, now instead of a paycheck comes in and start to scramble, I've already designated 
10%, 25%, 1%, two different accounts, two different objectives, two different goals I've set, and I'm already out the gate winning and running. Yeah, that's great. I, I, the Focusing on the positives, focusing on your strengths makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm curious, Jed, who is the most influential person in your life that comes to the way that when it comes to the way that you think about money? Did anybody instill these kind of behaviors in you that you that you can kind of put point a finger? I on, mean, put a finger definitely, on. you know, my parents, my upbringing instilled the the work ethic and the mindset. I, you know, and I challenge them today in some of the stances he has, but rich dad, poor dad changed my life it ha as it has millions because it allowed me to see money differently. What I wanted to do was build the next book to rich dad, poor dad. Now that you've changed your mindset to money, what are the actions you're supposed to go take? That's what money vehicle is about is you go through the program. Here are the 10 things that I will say you are supposed to go do. I, and I look at how we change the psychology of money. Morgan Housel, I thought that was a phenomenal shift in the approach and the realization and recognition of how we are all seeing this thing. As you pointed out, husband, wife, kids, we all see money differently. And one of the greatest questions I ask to every classroom, college, or whoever I get to talk to is a simple one, and it's a fill in the blank. Money is... If you can answer that, money is what to you, you will start to see that influencer, that community, that culture impact that you've had on what you look at money as. Um, and so what I'm ex most excited about is people continue to change my perspective of money on a weekly basis because they introduce me to new ways and perspectives that I could have never seen before. Yeah, isn't that that really is the best it's, part of this process? Because I I feel that every conversation I have, I come out thinking of ways that I have to improve. I can improve. I can help my kids improve, and that's what I appreciate you coming on and having this conversation because I've already got a uh, hundred more things to think about. It. So we could go a long way down some oh, yeah. long rabbit holes, but we have only a certain amount of time, so. I want to get to our fast and fun round questions because I know there's going to be some good stuff, some great nuggets that uh, that you will drop on us, uh, Mr. Jedediah Collins. So let's. Are you ready I, for the fast and fun? I round hope so. I, I I usually perform well <laughs> under pressure. Hopefully that stands. Yes, I think uh, I think you will uh, do perfectly fine. So first question: What does the term "money empowered"? mean to you? I want to begin by saying it means money vehicles working. That's one of our goals. Financial education fails without empowerment. So we are after financial empowerment, meaning you have the confidence to take these actions. We define it by USE. That means you understand what money is and what you're supposed to do. You've built a strategy of how, and then you can find efficiencies to improve your system. U-S-E. If you are money empowered, you understand how to use money. Beautiful. Thank you. So what is the best investment of time or money you've spent on your kids to date? This is a hard one. And honestly, one, I'm a journaler, so I could go and take a couple hours and dive deep into this. I'm going to go with something that actually didn't cost me anything. It was a gift from my father-in-law. It was a tent. Why I choose the tent is because it has given us a dozen nights and experiences of isolated time. Me and my girls, my wife is not a big camper, so she doesn't join us. But looking at it, it is time that we will forever remember and forever cherish. Um, and it also just goes to the idea of it cost us nothing. Half of those nights were in our backyard, just, you know, posting up in, in a tent. So, um, that has been a gift that we'll continue to give. We already have our camping set up for this summer. So um, that message of doesn't matter the cost, it is the experience and the intimacy of uh, isolation. That's wonderful. Thank you. 
So Jed, what advice to your kids do you most hope that they will listen to? And this could be future advice as well, since they're young. Well, John, as at 19 and 17, I, I don't know if they start to listen to you more, but uh, my hope is that they do hear one message from me. And it's a, a term, and I, I am a professional speaker, so I do get to go speak on this. I am a great failure. And I love to say that. I love for them to see that. And we've worked very hard and I've drilled them on what failure to daddy is. Failure to me is not trying. I don't care the outcome. I don't care the whatever measurement. I don't care unless you don't try. And they will be very clear. My last message to them every day of school is be kind, try hard, and I love you. And I know the one message that if a teacher asks them, what does your daddy say? He says, try or else we fail. And as an entrepreneur, that is something that I've had to swallow and really try to believe in. But I'm trying. And regardless of if Money Vehicle is a massive success, which knock on wood, hopefully it will be or not, my effort has not been questioned as the hardest working man in financial literacy. Again, not self-titled. I've had people tell me that, but <laughs> failure is not trying. I hope they know that message by now. That is a very powerful message, and um, I'll need another decade to know if they're uh, listening <laughs> true. more now. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you could transmit transmit a message that everyone would see, skywritten, billboard, wherever, maybe all those places, yeah. what would that message say? Again, another one. I love thought experiments that I've sat and pondered uh, over the last couple of days. You know, I originally want to go with something that's going to connect to money vehicle. You know, maybe we're on a billboard. Let's get some publicity. I think it would be a simple message. Yeah, connect away. I think it would be act like an investor. Again, not think. Think is good. Education is good. Education is the first part in use. Understand it. But act like an investor. That means you invest not only your money in a decade time frame, you also invest yourself in a decade time frame. One of our biggest messages to students is income sure is related to education, sure is related to experience. It's also most related to you developing a skill set that is going to be more valuable next year. So if you act like an investor, you're going to ask yourself, how I, Jedediah Collins, am going to be more valuable in 2033? That's my investment mindset. And so acting like an investor would be a message I think everybody should hear. And truly, as we talked about saving and inflation, investing must become the norm in financial literacy. I love that, uh, changing that to act. That is a very good point. Okay, so what is the one parenting and or money smarts book other than your own, of course? Um, and <laughs> caught it be, me. You uh, caught me, John. Book. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We will have links to all this information in the show notes, but a book, podcast, um, or any really, any media, what that you go back to or that you gift the most often? Uh, one as a young parent that helped me again, I'm a routine oriented person is called baby wise. I thought baby wise gave me a preparation of the world of chaos and unexpected. So I thought as parenting, I thought that one was really excellent. We talked about the psychology of money. I think people beginning in money, rich dad, poor dad is a phenomenal introduction. But if you really want to start to comprehend your baggage of money. I think Psychology of Money is is an excellent read, very entertaining in the stories. Um, but as we mentioned a few times, I, if you have a five to 15 year old, money isn't necessarily the focus. They don't understand it completely yet. So reading The Power of Habits, Atomic Habits, reading more about actual actions and principles and behaviors, I think is going to be more paramount. And so those are two books that I've continued to recommend and continue to try to build into my own processes and routines. And I think if you can look at a, a student and look at your child and do the marshmallow example of, no, their behavior is understanding the power of time, understanding the power of delayed gratification, which again, flip that. It is not a sacrifice. It is always a prioritization of your goals. So I think those mindsets, behaviors are going to be even better instilled through books and podcasts. 
Yeah. I think that's why we connected and enjoyed our uh, initial conversations, Jed, is because those two books, uh, Psychology of Money and Atomic Habits, are really, I mean, Psychology of Money was our giveaway, our, our standard graduation gift for kids, uh, for our friends' kids. And then uh, obviously we give them to our, ki- to our kids as well. And Atomic Habits, those two books will go a long way. To, uh, to helping our kids develop the habits and money smarts uh, that they need. All right. So, uh, Jet, how can people find you on social media and or the web? So find us at Your Money Vehicle, yourmoneyvehicle.com. Uh, we have a great curriculum for high school students, college age students. You can be asynchronous or however you'd like to engage Uh, You can follow me at The Fullback of Finance, combining my two worlds, The Fullback of Finance on social medias, uh, but Money Vehicle and Your Money Vehicle is right now in about 14 different states. And as 10 more are issuing state mandates, hopefully you're going to be looking for an opportunity to bring us to your high school, which we take sponsorships and support to make it free into the school system. Um, But yeah. Would love to reach out, ask questions, and see how we can help empower the the nation to understand how to use money. Well, Jedediah Collins, it has been fantastic having you on the show. The hardest working man in personal finance. I really appreciate your time and all your knowledge. John, thank you. Enjoy the day, and uh, we'll talk soon.